Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad uh, to be here in London and to address the seminar after 25 years of EPMA. I'm going to change gears here. I'm not going to talk about uh, iron powder. I will not talk too much about the past. I'll try to talk about what I know in my uh, 40 years at the PM community. So the title says hard materials. Uh, the title says hard materials, but it's actually uh, it's going to be with hard metals, but still a strategic industry since birth. This industry is about 100 years old, and uh, my outline Okay, sorry. Okay, uh, my outline is, uh, I'll say a few words about early history, and talk about, uh, okay, they want me, I prefer to stand here, okay. Uh, you can see the outline. Uh, it's not about history, and I was hoping that uh, Paul would talk more about pressing and uh, <laughs> shaping. He didn't, so that's bad luck. So, actually, the birth of uh, hard materials, hard metals, uh, was around 1900, and uh, as you all know, it was uh, Vidya, the Leipzig Fair, which gave the starting the gun for the race which is going on now. So between 1922 and 1927 where uh, we had uh, the real race for making good quality hard metals, what happened was uh, in 1923 uh, there was a Schroeder patent, patent and was granted in October 1925, but only for Russia, uh, not for Russia, uh, England, uh, UK, and Germany. And this uh, faux pas of not patenting this material for Russia came the Germans uh, really bad uh, for their history. I'll come to that a little bit later. So um, these are some of the early uh, hard metal uh, parts that were made, and the first uh, part that really signaled the birth of uh, hard metals for as a tool were where the drawing dies here to their left. The drawing dies came about because uh, we wanted uh, to have uh, wear resistant material to make tungsten wires for electric bulbs and filaments. What uh, we always uh, forget is because uh, uh, we don't have that many people from Russia, but Igor Konyashin, who works for Element 6 now, he has uh, published a paper in the ITA uh, in uh, 1923, and he gave me some of these pictures, and uh, let me talk give a few words about this. So um, this is one of the companies, uh, uh, a Moscow cement carbide plant, which uh, was started in, according to history, according to what, what he's saying, also in 1927. They knew about the patent, they knew about what was going on, they knew it was not uh, patented in Russia, so uh, they had all the information to make a parallel development in Russia. Uh, this is the picture those days, uh, before in the Soviet Union uh, times, and nowadays uh, this company has been taken over and belongs to the same group. Russia we always had a, a planned economy, and so, Hard metals was uh, a strategic uh, area, and the government had about 10 different uh, uh, companies spread out all around uh, the, the Soviet Union at that time, and they produced hard metals. If you look at uh, Eastern Europe as such, uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, this uh, slide is from 1990. We had about altogether about 2,500 tons uh, of uh, similar carbide being produced. The major uh, producer was uh, Russia with seven large and 20 small uh, companies. 
the next biggest one was uh, Pramit in uh, Sumpag and many of these companies uh, had licenses uh, from different uh, manufacturers in Western Europe, other than the Russians who could do go ahead on their own. Now, when we see uh, Russia with 700 to 900 tons, at the end of the war, uh, Group Media was manufacturing about 500 tons of carbide. And it was related to the war effort. Um, Russia was also manufacturing about 700 tons. This was a tungsten carbide nickel bonded alloy. And it was mainly used for bullets. 70% of the German uh, tanks destroyed during the invasion or the tried invasion of uh, Russia were destroyed by tungsten carbide nickel bonded bullets. So, uh, where's Paul? Paul has gone out. Uh, it's, what, it's not the iron bullets that really worked, it was actually the tungsten carbide uh, nickel bonded bullets. And that's why I said uh, because we didn't patent it in Germany, it really was a disaster for whichever way you want to look at. Pardon? For what? Maybe. Okay. Good. So um, that's a, a very short uh, uh, timeline about the history. And uh, let me talk about uh, the last 25 years. The last 25 years uh, has been uh, rather turbulent and exciting for the hard metal industry. We have seen uh, positive growth and consolidation. Uh, from the people's point of view, the war generation retired during these last 25 years. All the people I learned from about powder metallurgy, about uh, carbide, they have all retired and they all started up from zero. Most of the people I worked with had, did not have any formal education. They did not go to a university, there was nothing like that. They learned by themselves by trial and error and it was really difficult coming from a university trying to uh, get some semblance of uh, discipline into the way of making, doing experiments and uh, reaching results. So, um, if my memory is not failing me, uh, in uh, 1989, the global uh, carbide market was about 30,000 uh, tons of uh, tungsten carbide cobalt. Today, it is more than 60,000 tons. With recycling, it will be about 100 thousand tons. So in 25 years we have grown at least three times and uh, only in Germany in 89, uh, 89 it was about uh, uh, 3,000 tons in uh, the data published by the Fachverband for Polymetallurgy and today it is close to 10,000 tons. So within Germany as well, the German speaking country that includes Austria, Switzerland and uh, Germany not all data is uh, included in this because not all members uh, are members of the Fachverband, but we have really grown three times in 25 years. Now, when I say it has been turbulent, uh, this uh, 25 years has seen a lot of uh, uh, consolidation in the industry. As an example, uh, takeovers. Bullerit uh, from Austria uh, became a part of LMT. Uh, Plans Etisit. Uh, made a joint venture with uh, uh, Ceradisit or Cera Metal and became Ceradisit about ten, uh, 10 years ago, 10 and 11 years ago. Stelram in Switzerland uh, was taken over by ATI and is now part of Kenna Metal. The production in uh, Switzerland is uh, more or less closed. Group Media went through a lot of uh, trials and turbulations and uh, is now called, I think, Kenna Metal Media, right? Okay. Hurdle, uh, one of the pioneers. Uh, who started up in the 1950s from Saar Hart Metal became a Kenna Metal Hurtle and is part of the Kenna Metal Group in uh, Germany. Uh, Baytec, which started off as Simon Carbide or uh, making spikes for the hard metal industry, is now Indus, uh, the Indus Group, and is one of the major producers of carbide, more than 45 tons per month. Both hard metal has become element six. Uh, the company where I worked for for 20 years, uh, Loiko Hard Metal, became Saratisit Hob. Hard Metal AG uh, went broke uh, two years ago and is now Hard Metal Estec. And uh, Walter AG in Tubingen was taken over by 
or Sandvik. And the, it goes on and on, uh, but uh, the most uh, uh, exciting thing, or not exciting, but uh, really sad thing is uh, the large company uh, VEB uh, Hartmetallwerk Immelborn, which had more than 3,000 people, which was a fully integrated production, uh, has lost more than 90% of their workforce and uh, is now a part of tri uh, Tribo and doing well. We have also seen that Pramit in uh, Sumpak has become Seiko and uh, Huta Baldon in uh, Poland has become Sandvik. It's not all bad news, uh, it's all good news. We have grown and there have been new companies as well which have uh, uh, been part of this growth story. There's Conrad Friedrichs for extrusion parts, the same applies for Arno Friedrichs uh, and uh, during uh, LH started their own uh, carbide production in Berlin. And all these three companies produce about 45 tons uh, of uh, carbide per month, at least. The, another startup company which is doing very well is uh, Horn in Tübingen, which uses a lot of MIM and extrusion technology to make their parts for, for carbide. The raw materials front, uh, tungsten carbide is the most important uh, raw material, and we have seen that uh, HC Stark has changed hands from the uh, family and uh, first investors, and now is part of uh, an investment group uh, is it Carlyle? I'm not sure. I think it's Carlyle. And uh, Wolfram Bagbao is now in the hands of Sandvik. So, um, the last 25 years has really been a period of growth. And uh, the first 10 years uh, has been uh, a growth in uh, Europe. And the last 15 years, the growth comes from Asia. Asia is mainly China. So uh, capacity and turnover in Europe has grown two to three times, but uh, growth in Asia has been more than 10 times in this period. So this is just a few words about, uh, just checking my time, I don't want to. So 13 minutes are up, good. So let me come to raw materials. The most important raw material is tungsten for the tungsten carbide cobalt industry. Uh, and you can see that uh, cemented carbide Two uh, things are the major use of uh, uh, tungsten, and they estimated the global consumption in 2010. If you can read it, it's a total of 71,000 tons of tungsten, virgin material, and including scrap is about 100,000 tons. This data is from uh, what from Bagbao. If you see where the tungsten is coming from, the majority is from China. The reserves, as well as the mine production uh, is from China. And uh, we have learned a lesson. Uh, in the late 80s, uh, everybody thought uh, we have cheap uh, tungsten from China. So we stop all our mines, we stop all uh, uh, refining activities, and we have paid the price. If you look at this, uh, it's a shame that this thing doesn't work. So if you, if you look at the, uh, this, uh, graph, the blue line is the tungsten uh, oxide price in real terms of 2013 in US dollars. So in the 50s, we really went up high to $600 uh, because of the, of the uh, Korean War. In 75, uh, around about 75, we also had uh, a tungsten boom because if you remember in the 70s, we had the onset of uh, coatings. So coatings give a new lease of life uh, to hard metals. Uh, and in 2005, the Chinese decided that they have full control of the tungsten market. Uh, Hong Kong was closed to free trading and for smuggling. Before that, we, we could get anything we wanted from through Hong Kong. And uh, they just put on the screws and uh, we have been suffering the prices within one year, they went up by three to five times, depending on uh, where you bought your, your powder. Even today, uh, the powder is uh, much more expensive, and if you buy the same powder in China, it's about 30% cheaper compared to the price you pay in Europe. A few words about uh, trends. In 1989, uh, the very fine-grained hard metal, less than uh, 0.8 microns, it was less than 
I remember talking to uh, producers, they said, oh, forget it. It takes four times more time to produce uh, 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 powder with 0 0.8 microns compared with a normal 2.5 uh, micron grain size. And they said, I want to, they want me to pay double the amount for this material, which we couldn't pay. Today, it's submicron and smaller size uh, WC is more than 50% of the total, especially because we use it for round tools, for drilling, reaming, etc. The other uh, area, the trend is for extra coarse uh, uh, tungsten carbide because this material is used for, for um, rock drilling where the demand is growing because we need, we have more and more people and we need more and more tools. A few words about process equipment. Uh, what has happened in the last 25 years, uh, we have seen the onset of spray drying with uh, water instead of uh, organics. Uh, we are getting closer to near net shape due to direct pressing, due to the accuracy of the dyes as well as the machines. Uh, we go to iso isostatic pressing, extrusion, injection molding. In sintering, the ad advances are uh, sintering with atmosphere control. That means we can change the atmosphere and uh, control the carbon content at different stages depending on what's going on during the process. And uh, using Sinterhip as a post consolidation treatment to get rid of all the remaining pores that are still open. Final shaping, uh, grinding has become uh, very precise. Uh, we can make tools with a run out of, uh, can't believe it, it's one micron. You can't use it because uh, the machine has a run out of most probably 20 microns. And uh, we have EDM, precision EDM. Uh, we have uh, electrochemical machining, ECM. And joining processes like brazing and uh, gluing have really gone so uh, forwards that uh, I can make a, a cutting saw for wood uh, where the saw tips are glued. And you should remember one thing, this uh, saw tip or saw is running at 50 meters per second cutting speed. Uh, coating has been really given uh, hard metals a second life. Without coatings, we'll still be uh, most probably at 30,000 tons uh, per year, 30,000 tons per year. So the first coating that came up was uh, CVD chemical vapor deposition and uh, later on uh, uh, physical vapor deposition and naturally diamonds. And let's not forget one thing. Uh, we are surviving in Europe because we have recycling. We have recycling facilities uh, in, uh, at H.C. Stark as well as uh, at uh, what from Bagbao. And uh, uh, the Chinese and the Asians are also building up uh, huge capacities for recycling. They pay you a premium just to get rid of all the tungsten carbide from the European market. There are companies in the UK, there are companies in uh, Germany who pay a premium of 20% to get it back to China. But don't quote me, please. Um, innovation is pressing technology. So the most important thing is uh, the electric press, which uses, has a smaller footprint, as well as uses less energy and causes less uh, pollution, uh, noise pollution. Advantages, again, is uh, we have a very high repetition uh, accuracy. And uh, Paul, we don't need uh, stoppers here. That's a real advantage because uh, in the early days, I used to break a number of tools. Nowadays, uh, it's really come down to almost zero. And another good thing about these precision uh, machines is uh, we can have a tool change within 20 minutes. We can start, so it means we can make shorter runs and we are not uh, bound to making 10,000 pieces at one time. I could change tools for 500 uh, pieces runs, which was unthought of before. Uh, sintering is also uh, a big uh, advantage uh, in the last 25 years. To the left, you see the old uh, sintering furnaces which were used uh, at the beginning of the Hartmill age. And today we have uh, vacuum sintering furnaces. Uh, the sizes are about, uh, internal sizes are about 500, 500 times uh, three meters long. And this is a purely vacuum sintering furnaces with debinding and everything in one go. Uh, I can run such furnaces from home using my team viewer. I'm a consultant, so I run a couple of furnaces around the world. by just looking at team viewer with the uh, online access to the 
furnace, I cannot change oil, I cannot uh, do, uh, uh, load the furnace, but everything else is possible. And the real breakthrough came through with uh, a cinder hip furnace, uh, which is also of the same size. And the cinder hip furnace leads uh, to the fact that anybody can make good hard metal if the starting raw material is good. In the early days, uh, we had to be very careful about choice of uh, starting material, carbon content and whatever. Nowadays with the cinder hip, uh, we are also able to use more, a lot more recycling material. A few words about coatings, second life. Uh, you see here some examples uh, of uh, CVD coatings, uh, multi-layer coatings, and uh, the main improvements uh, nowadays is in the aluminum oxide top layer coating, which gives uh, the inserts uh, higher wear resistance, chemical wear resistance, as well as high temperature wear resistance. So we can have uh, coatings going up to 20 uh, microns in thickness, and uh, depending on uh, who says it, Almost everybody says uh, the lifetime is increased by 100%, but I don't know what's the baseline. So, but we can uh, really uh, believe uh, the suppliers because it's just not the coating, it's a geometry coating, machine, holder, uh, workpiece material, which is important, and 100% uh, to life increases are possible. The real breakthrough uh, for uh, hard metal tools is in PVD coating, physical vapor deposition. There are two methods. Uh, are making it, but almost all elements in the universe are used nowadays for making uh, PVD coatings. The PVD coatings are normally much thinner, two microns in size, thickness for milling, and it can go up to 20 microns in size uh, also for turning. And uh, the latest developments are you can use uh, PVD for also for uh, depositing aluminum oxide. That was a, a problem in the early days. And if you can do that, it's also an ecological uh, uh, advantage because if you use uh, CVD, you have a lot of uh, chemicals you've got to get rid of, and the PVD process is uh, uh, more uh, ecologic, uh, eco-friendly, eco yeah, exactly. And uh, you can play with this uh, coding as you like. Uh, um, you can uh, create uh, nanostructures, you can create multi-layers. I've seen layers uh, of 0 0.5 microns in size, uh, hundreds of them, and they're all supposed to be better than everything else. But with the advent of PVD and uh, with the uh, PVD, which gives you a very sharp cutting edge, we have now moved away from the P grade of uh, carb uh, cemented carbide for cutting tools to the straight tungsten carbide cobalt grades with uh, grain sizes of tungsten carbide of 0 0.8 microns. So 0 0.8 microns gives you also a sharper cutting edge. That means cutting forces are lower. You can run at higher cutting speeds. So these coatings have also given an added advantage to moving to much simpler uh, substrate metallurgy. So uh, this uh, diagram uh, is just uh, shows you that Coatings have gone a long way to improve your wear resistance, and even ceramics or cermets uh, are coated with uh, hard materials nowadays to improve their, their lifetime by a factor of 100%. And um, the area 25 years ago with diamond coatings, we knew about diamond coatings 25 years ago, but uh, the addition was very poor. Uh, nowadays, uh, we make uh, millions of uh, pieces of uh, of uh, drills, 3 8 inch for the, for the, for example, for aircraft, every Airbus uh, 380 has 50,000 holes, which has been drilled for the, just with rivets. I don't talk about the, the doors and the windows and whatever, but just the rivets. And it's all CFC, uh, titanium, and uh, only using uh, diamond coated tungsten carbide can be uh, reach the requirements of this industry. A few words uh, about modeling and simulation. That's also new in the last uh, 25 years. We have a process simulation. I will not uh, go through that because I'm running out of time, I think. That'd be the main steps uh, of the simulation process. And uh, Peter Bruin will know this uh, very well because uh, we started this RADNET uh, during your time, right? And the main thing 
uh, is, uh, for example, there's an example for die filling. We have modeled the die filling, Peter, remember? Yeah, and uh, APM uh, for compaction, uh, density uh, distribution of the, of the tool loading, the new things are FEM uh, calculations about debinding, uh, about sintering, which uh, leads to the fact that we have less sinter distortion and uh, crack forma formation. So we can optimize the whole process and we get near net shape products by, by pressing. Uh, we use uh, uh, modeling not only for uh, producing the parts, but also for the end product. This is an example from Hilti, uh, thanks to Steve, uh, where they use the whole process starting from microstructure simulation for the hard metal to manufacturing, that is uh, brazing and cooling simulation, the welding process simulation where the hard metal is welded to the steel shank, and the simulation during application, which means uh, what happens when you have an impact, uh, what happens when you hit a steel uh, a rebar when you're, when you're uh, uh, working, the, uh, the design of the helix so that the material which is being drilled can be taken out, etc. So this is just a very simple example. We also have uh, um, improved the method to calculate phase diagrams. In 1977, 78, we used to calculate the phase diagrams. I had to carry uh, my uh, Fortran uh, punch card to the large computer. I was working in the Nuclear Research Center. We had a big computer. But I would get the results one day later and it said, you have a mistake in line 68. So start again. And uh, to just calculate one phase diagram, I need a, about a week, about a week. Today, uh, uh, Suzanne Nogren said she can make it in 10 minutes. So uh, it's not only about phase diagrams, it's about uh, diffusion and kinetics as well. We are progressing along this, but to have good phase diagrams calculated, you need good experimental results. And that is, as usual, always the bottleneck. So this is a, a, an example how a calculated phase diagram could look like for tungsten carbide cobalt. I don't have to go in there in detail. Uh, what is uh, rather new is that we can not only calculate the phase diagrams, but now the latest uh, is that we can start calculating the interfacial phase diagrams because we do not have equilibrium conditions during sintering. We always think we have equilibrium conditions during sintering and after cooling, but in reality, it's not in equilibrium. And what happens at the interface between the carbide carbide or the carbide binder is the most important thing for all mechanical properties for your material, as well as for the uh, chemical properties like corrosion resistance. So um, uh, just about uh, three or four months ago, I had the opportunity to uh, listen to a talk. I didn't understand everything. So I will not uh, go into detail. What we have also uh, been able to uh, confirm is that grain growth inhib inhibition in fine grain material is because, uh, for example, in, uh, when you dope with the vanadium carbide, you have a very thin layer of uh, vanadium carbide at the tungsten carbide cobalt boundary. Some of us thought we could see that, but there was no proof now due to better uh, technology in the characterization, we have proof that there's a thin layer and we also know about the mechanisms of uh, growth. And this is, for example, uh, a phase diagram for uh, an interface which shows which, at which concentration of tungsten, uh, of uh, vanadium, the uh, vanadium phase which stops the growth of the uh, carbide crystals is active. So we can do that for vanadium, titanium, uh, whatever. And let me move on then to applications. Applications uh, uh, for hard metal is always dependent on the cobalt content and the, car uh, and the carbide grain size. And depending on which grain size and, and cobalt content you choose, you can choose material for different applications. And these applications have been around for since the beginning of uh, the use of uh, hard metal. 
Now, uh, the application distribution of hard metals, uh, according to the data from uh, ITIA from 2010, uh, which is very important, the world consumption by weight on the, uh, to my right, on to your left, from, the, uh, from your side, um, for metal cutting is just 22% by weight. And uh, wood cutting is uh, more, and uh, stone working is also more. But if you look at the turnover in euros, the uh, metal cutting turnover is almost three times as much as uh, uh, the use and weight. This is because of the added value by grinding, uh, coating, and attaching it to a, to a tool. So an insert might cost, let's say, uh, two euros or three euros, but if it is on a, on a uh, milling tool, the milling tool would cost you 100 euros. So, and this is a very important uh, 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 factor to keep in mind that metal cutting gives us the maximum uh, increase in, uh, yeah. Um, a few words about uh, world markets. Uh, this is uh, from a recent report from uh, Daedalus uh, Consulting from the US. Uh, in 2013, for metal machining equipment and tools, the global volume is 110, 110 billion euros. Now, out of this 110 billion euros, uh, machine tools make about 75% and uh, cutting tools is 15%. So, uh, right now, we have a projected turnover or market of 16 billion uh, dollars for cutting tools. Um, I have data from uh, IPMD where this number is about 22 uh, billion uh, dollars. So it's between 16 and 22, I would say. And the most important thing is uh, the projections for 2018 is uh, about 22 billion dollars globally. That means we have a CAGR, compounded aggregate growth rate, of about 5%. Uh, tool holders and systems uh, make 5% of these uh, uh, investment costs and the wear parts where you change the chucks and whatever, make another 5%. But keep in mind always that cutting tools account for only about 3% of total machining costs. So even though we say we are a strategic industry and uh, we are very important, our part of the whole cake is very small and that's because uh, we were not smart enough in marketing. Uh, there are different types of uh, metal cutting tools and uh, the world market uh, for the same uh, Daedalus uh, Consulting is uh, according to tool material in, in dollars, it's not in quantities, not, uh, Philip, not 7% of the total weight, but uh, in the total PM market, this is U, uh, US dollars. WC hard metal makes about 53%. 50, 50%. Uh, 89, 1989. Uh, High-speed steel was about 40% of the total market, and we had uh, diamond 3 or 4%, and uh, CBN was 1 or 2%, and cement was 3% mainly in Japan. So there's been a change in the use of uh, cutting tool material as well in the last 25 years. Some examples uh, of tools, and uh, because we are in the, in the PM uh, community, I have some dyes for metal powder, uh, uh, pressing and uh, shaping. Without these tools, without these tools, which have now a lifetime of about 200 shots. When I started, uh, I was happy when I had 10,000 uh, shots per, per die. Now we have more than 200,000 and still going strong. And we have better accuracy and we have more materials, not only for the die, but also for the punches. And the punches can also be coded so that uh, the PM people can really profit from reducing tool costs. Uh, this is just a small, uh, funny example. Uh, here to your right is a hair and a 50 micrometer drill for the PCB industry. Normally, not my hair, but a normal hair is about 50 microns thick, and these drills have a diameter of 20 microns. And if you imagine, 20 microns means you have carbide grains maybe 10 or 15, and they have to be very uniform and very reliable. 
yeah and to the left is the normal drill uh, 100 um, micron drill and you can see my, uh, the thumbprint next to it so that's the reason why all our uh, iPhones and uh, everything else can become so small so small I was uh, at Foxconn uh, two years ago they make 20,000 tools per month just for the iPhone 20,000 tools per month for the iPhone and they asked me to set up a factory for making 2 million tools per month. But I should do it within one year. I wouldn't be here if I had accepted that offer. So coming to the outlook, this is just a general picture to show how positive uh, the world looks like. The highest ma money making commodity per country globally, and you can see, you don't have to read it now, you can uh, uh, go to the homepage. It's the CIA uh, which gave this information. So almost every area we can use cutting tools. Uh, in the area of fish and uh, fish production at uh, Unimeco, we make the cutting tools out of uh, stainless steel. But otherwise, uh, we don't need it for coffee or tea. But otherwise, you can really use it. And we come to Europe. You can see that Europe is the world's workshop at the moment. It still is. And we have most of the machinery and the motor vehicles are made. And Asia is uh, the manufacturing center. But if you see the major products, I'm sure you will agree that we have a bright future if we develop the right products. So the future is, uh, we have a growing demand. The opportunities are growing demand, especially in emerging countries, where we, have, uh, where we need innovations in materials, coatings, processes, and products. We have new applications, for example, in aerospace or in medical tools. There are also some risks, risks and the major risk is the raw material supply and pricing. We, don't, uh, we can't control it at the moment in Europe. And the health and safety regulations. Positive is, again, the global market growth rates. And uh, I repeat what uh, uh, Winfried Upan said. The foundation, the outlook of our industry is people, 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 open-minded, whatever, made it happen. And it's up to us to make it happen for the next 50, 25 years, you name it. So thanks to EBMA. Thank you very much. I've been uh, associated with the PM for about 40 years. And uh, EBMA has always been a good uh, partner and companion in turbulent times, in good times. The last six years have been especially a uh, lot of fun with the EHFG group, uh, with uh, my friends Steve mostly and Brian and everybody else who have made life really very interesting. So thank you again.